This podcast is produced by the Center for Deployment Psychology at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. The views expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Uniformed Services University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. In addition, references to any specific companies, products, processes, or services does not necessarily constitute or imply endorsement by the Uniformed Services University, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Welcome to CDP's podcast, Practical for Your Practice where we give you actionable intel to support what you do. One colleague to another. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to CDP's Practical for Your Practice podcast. I'm Corinne Lefkowitz, and I'm joined by my friend and fellow co-host, Kevin Holloway. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Corinne. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you doing? Hanging in there, you know. I mean, it, it, I'm glad I'm feeling really good right now because I know that the, the, our topic for today is perhaps a little bit heavy and that's okay. I mean, like we, we as providers encounter a lot of heavy things all the time and it's, and it's great to be able to talk about them, but you know, I mean, don't as you feel a, like we say that at the beginning of most of our episodes, Yeah, we probably do, point. don't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but Such you are, is the nature of being a mental health provider, right? You got it. Yeah, yeah. We deal with some heavy stuff and uh, yeah, today's episode is no exception. Um, but fortunately we have uh, an expert who's going to yes. walk us through some of the hardest parts of working with caregivers of uh, children with serious mental illness and suicide risk. Mm. So we have an expert, Dr. Alejandra Arango, who is joining us. Hello. Hello. How are you? Lovely to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much for being here and for joining us. Um, Can we maybe start by just having you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm Alejandra Arango. I'm a clinical child psychologist. Currently, I work in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan. Um, and I'll just share that what I will be sharing today are my opinions and don't necessarily reflect the um, opinions of, of the University of Michigan. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have been here for quite a bit of time because I also trained here. Um, so I got my PhD in, in clinical psychology here at U of M and then did a fellowship here in uh, the Department of Psychiatry tree as well um but it might so kind of at home this is kind of at home yeah, yeah it's surprisingly the place i've lived the longest in my life and i've lived <laughs> many places um but yes so i i really love my current role because i get to do a little bit of everything so my research is with the youth depression and suicide prevention research program here at u of m and i've been involved with that research lab since the start of grad school um but I also get to do some clinical work and some teaching. And a lot of my clinical work is really youth presenting with depression. I work a bit in the psychosis, um, early psychosis assessment and intervention clinic. And what I sort of enjoy the most is sort of working, like you were saying at the start with those youth um, who are elevated risk for suicide and who um, sort of like core aspects of treatment are really like suicide prevention interventions. And that, that's what sort of most of my clinical work ends up looking like. So basically the toughest cases is what you have chosen to do in your career, which, which gets me immediately wondering why, Why? (laughs) what motivates you to do this really hard work? Is there something that drives you to do this? Yes, absolutely. So I I initially got into this. So I always knew I wanted to work with kids. um, And I took a psychology course, which I loved in in high school and and then decided I'm I'm going to major in psychology, which is surprising because I'm quite undecisive, but I really knew this. Um, But then in undergrad, I took a service learning course um, where I got to volunteer at a crisis center. And part of volunteering there was answering calls from the National um, Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And I honestly remember my very first call and it was an adolescent who um, was experiencing suicidal thinking. And, And so I had the opportunity through that experience to be trained and Um, You know, I remember the safety plan that I created with this kid and um, and I think at that time I just began to see sort of how many kids are struggling with suicidal thinking. I mean, it's quite alarming and recent data sort of show us that um, almost 20 percent of high school students report suicidal ideation in the past year. Wow. um, And 10 percent report a suicide attempt. This is uh, data here in the U.S. But so at that time, I sort of started to see that and. Um, I was just drawn in, right, I think as psychologists or psychiatrists or social workers or um, other kinds of physicians, you know, we um, 
I think we want to help. And, and for me, you know, sort of supporting someone who is in such a, a place of such pain that they want to end their life. Um, you know, I think it's, I've been, I just feel so grateful to have all the opportunities to train in this area and to continue the work in this area because we unfortunately still have a lot to do to sort of improve suicide care and reduce the suicide rate. Um, For sure. And, you know, I, as you were talking about some of the, the rates and stuff, my, my, I had a couple of reactions. One reaction was, wow, you know, that's, that's high and, and high almost to feel not normal necessarily, but certainly not uncommon. Um, and then also I'll, I'll have to, I'll disclose a little bit here. Like for me, a part of the reaction is that I've recently been dealing with some of this with my own child. Right. And so I'm, I'm curious, especially from a caregiver point of view, you know, what do we know? What do we learn? What do we need still need to learn, um, you know, about uh, suicide prevention and about really just how do we help these kids, right? I mean, it, I imagine there's a lot of overlap, but perhaps even some differences too between some of the other suicide prevention care and techniques that we are, you know, all of us hopefully are learning for our adult clients. But uh, I imagine that there are some particularly important differences with adolescent uh, clients too, and, and, and their caregivers too, their parents as well. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. And I think um, exactly what you're saying is one of my, I have many reasons why I love working with children. And it's not just that you get to play Uno sometimes, but it's like that you get to have this team, right? And when you work with a child, it isn't just the child, right? It's it's often yeah. many others. It, it could be the school, it could be a sibling, it could be um, their coach at soccer, um, but a core part of that support team or that team um, is a caregiver, it is a parent, right? And I think, you know, a few things, um, is that it's it's really hard um, to see your child be in, in such a place, right? And it is a really difficult experience for parents. And I think it's certainly worth some time thinking about both how can we support a parent supporting a child and also how do we support a parent who is managing something that is new, something that is scary, something that like isn't talked about as much, right? So like... right. And, you know, I mean, with whatever perceived stigma comes along with that, but also, you know, I, I think I was mentioning even before we started recording that I even have questions for myself about, you know, how do I protect the confidentiality of my child, but at the same time, be able to talk about this too, you know? And so, yeah, so many questions. Like, I mean, I, there, there's, there's obviously, you know, some challenges, some stressors for caregivers of, you know, their, their children who are, um, whether it's, you know, have suicidal ideation all the way to an attempt and, you know, keeping them safe. There's some that make a lot of sense. Like that's scary. It's really scary. You know, mm -hmm. we, we don't like seeing our kids, you know, suffering that way and worries about what could happen. Are there some stressors that may not be as plainly obvious, um, that you're aware of as an expert here, you know, that, that maybe we should be aware of? Yeah, I appreciate that. So I think it's some of those common ones of like, this is scary. This is unknown territory. For sure. Um, sadly, you know, I think we've made maybe some progress over time as related to stigma, but I think there is still a lot of stigma. And like you were saying, sometimes these rates feel surprising and it's probably because we don't talk about them enough. So, you know, many of those things. Um, I think another source of stress is I think caregivers often don't feel sort of prepared to do the really hard things that we're asking them to do, right? So if, mm -hmm. you know, you as a clinician see a kid who's at risk for suicide and you send this kid home, you know, sure, as a clinician, it is hard this one hour that they're in front of you and maybe the other hours or times that you're thinking about them. Um, but then this parent has to bring this child home and, and we sort of entrust them with supporting their safety and caregivers yeah. many times don't feel prepared prepared to do that. And um, that is unimaginably sort of stressful. Um, you know, additional stressors are, think about a kid with any sort of chronic health condition, you're sort of pulled in, in a direction and you still have all, as a parent, you have all these other responsibilities, right? Including other children, including a job, including other responsibilities and the home and figuring out like, how do I support um, my child's safety and do the hundred other things I have to do in my life? Right. Um, 
that has to be incredibly stressful for parents. And, and like we were saying before, like a bit, a bit isolating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That isolation piece sounds, um, sounds really important to, to mention because if we're not, if it's happening so frequently, but we're not talking about it and you know, there's not a course in parenting class on how to, there, there's not parenting class to begin with a lot of times, but there's <laughs> Man, not a course, like, right. <laughs> there's not a course on how you deal with this to deal with all that on top of being isolated and maybe having some shame, I imagine. Um, oh gosh, right. it, it just seems so difficult to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, we don't have a ton of literature on this, but I was involved in a, a recent study that looked at parents who brought their kids to an emergency department for a suicide related concern. And the data is showing us that these parents are stressed, they're reporting depression symptoms, they're deport reporting anxiety symptoms, they're reporting um, lack of sleep, right? And so it's, it's not just stress, it's like, then it's, this is impacting their own well being. And think about, doing hard things when we're not sleeping and doing hard things when, you know, we're feeling really anxious and, and agitated. And so I think as clinicians, we have to figure out how do we better support these parents? How do we improve their self-efficacy, right? Their belief that they can do something that is really hard, right? And um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Yul Foster, did a study a, a few years ago, I think at this point of, again, um, parents that were bringing their kids into an emergency department for suicide risk. And, and they found that higher parental self-efficacy um, was related to greater engagement and sort of these discharge recommendations, right? And that makes sense, right? The more confident that we feel we can do a task, like I feel like, oh, I can get up this morning and give a talk or talk on this podcast and say things that are meaningful, right? The more likely I am to do it, right? And, and to feel yeah. successful and, and be able to follow through. So, you know, part of it is like, how do we improve parents' um, efficacy that they can do this really hard thing, which is support their kids' safety? Well, so just, just for our listeners' benefit, like, probably not everybody listening has expertise or maybe sees a lot of clients, you know, that have a suicidal crisis. What are some of these hard things that we're asking parents or other caregivers to do when, you know, whether it's their, their kid is being sent home from the ER and not being admitted, or, or maybe it's aftercare after a hospital. Like, what are we asking parents to do? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're asking parents to do a lot. We're asking parents to monitor their child. We're asking parents to engage um, in lethal means safety. We're asking parents to find a provider for their child. And we know that unfortunately, um, we're currently in and recently have been in a youth mental health crisis, right? Yeah. Where youth are struggling and where access to care is just so sorely limited, right? Um, and so we're, we're asking them to um, ensure safety and make sure this kid goes to school, even though they're not, you know, feeling right. okay and make right. sure that they connect with the school personnel and like, what do we tell the school personnel? How much do we tell them? How do we navigate that? Um, how do we, you know, we're asking parents to be parents. Like, how do you discipline a kid who is really distressed so true. and impaired in, in different ways, right? And it's such a fine line of keeping structure and, you know, being a parent and disciplining and, and setting boundaries and supporting and accommodating our child. Um, so those are just a few of the things that come to mind just as far as like, what are we asking parents to do here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now that you've set that stage for us, please tell me that there are ways to help parents feel, <laughs> caregivers feel more efficacious and more confident. Please, please give us some good news. <laughs> Yes, I think so. I think so. I have some ideas. So I think that um, for me, it really starts with involving parents and caregivers early. And I remind myself of this often and, and tell parents this is like you are an expert in your child in a way that I can never be. I can know all the knowledge and read all the books and um, know my field well and feel confident in what I do. But like you are an expert in this little human that's, you know, in front of me. Right. Um, and so we want to collaborate from the very beginning, right? So just when we're assessing suicide risk, we don't just wanna ask the kid the questions and rely on that. We wanna to turn to the parent and get from their perspective, like how has this kid yeah. has been doing, right? Um, we know humans differ, but I feel like children differ so much from one another, <laughs> so much more probably, right? Developmentally and maturity wise. And you know what, um, 
a concerning symptom in one kid might look very different from another. So often we ask parents about warning signs, like have you noticed any sort of changes in behaviors and emotions, right? And for one kid, you know, a, a sort of put in warning sign is something like withdrawal. Uh, for one kid, withdrawal might be, I don't get out of bed, I'm not coming to the dining room for dinner, I refuse to go to soccer. For another kid, they might be doing all these things. They might be going to the grocery store, they might be going to soccer, they might be going to school every day, but they are emotionally withdrawing, right? And how um, lucky are we that we can have a parent's perspective to, to help us disentangle some of that as, as much as possible. So we want to involve parents from the start. What are you seeing in your kid? What's concerning? What What is your kid saying, right? Is your kid making statements about um, self-harm? Has your child made statements about not wanting to be here, things not being worth it anymore, making statements about feeling hopeless? Um, all those sorts of things we want to gather from parents at the start. Um, and then following an assessment, we want to collaborate with parents to make a decision, right? As clinicians, sometimes we have strong recommendations and after I meet a kid and um, and I feel really concerned about their safety. I might make a strong recommendation that they receive a, a psychiatric evaluation, an emergency department, um, maybe that they connect to a higher level of care, like a partial hospitalization program. Um, and it's okay as clinicians to make those recommendations, but it's also so important to collaborate with parents and to make those decisions together to figure out what is feasible for this family, right? Um, you know, for kids, that we aren't sending to a higher level of care. We're sending them home with a safety plan. And a big part of that, like we've been discussing, is the parent monitoring them, right? And, and checking in and seeing how they're doing. And we have to collaborate with the parent to see, is this feasible for you, right? Somebody's working two jobs, their kid's spending 10 hours a day at home alone. Um, it might not be feasible to monitor a kid 24 hours a day. Um, so we have to think about something about it differently or, or um, work together to figure out a plan that works. For sure. Well, so you said safety plan, and I, I love that you bring that up because, you know, a lot of our training at CDP around suicide prevention is, you know, talking about like the Wenzel and Brown safety plans, right? And, and how do we implement that with clients? I imagine that it might be different implementing a safety plan with a child right, or, or an adolescent. And there, there probably are some age appropriate you know, adjustments that need to be made, but like what, what's different or, or what's the same or, or what does it mean to have a safety plan with an adolescent client that you would include caregivers as part of that? Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and we often kind of use the same template. And I think more recently, there's been more research about like, how do we sort of adapt this? And sometimes it's adapting language, right? right. Um, does a kid understand if a kid is 12, but maybe is developmentally functioning lower, do they understand what a warning sign is? And do we have to kind of think about what that means, right? Um, I think sometimes it means being more explicit and being more detailed, right? So for me, a safety plan, yeah. A coping skill would not be go read a book. It's like, what book are you going to read? Where are you going to sit when you read it? Where are you going to get yeah. this book from? Right. So I think sometimes with kids, it takes sort of like um, thinking through a lot of barriers that maybe for an adult. And I will say I don't, I don't ever work with adults as being my own patients, but um, that I think would be different with adults. Like a kid might say that they often feel suicidal in the school setting. And they might say that a coping skill might be to play a video game. Right. And so here as a clinician, yeah. we kind of have to come in and say, like, is this feasible for you to <laughs> play your PS3 or PS4 um, in the middle of math class? Probably not. So we have to think about what's going to work in, in that setting. Um, and so it's, yeah, language, it's sort of specificity. And, and again, it's really collaborative, right? We don't ever want to give a kid sort of the safety plan handout and say, fill it out, right? right. We want to think about it together. We want to get their ideas. I think even when a kid is apprehensive, often, um, you know, after maybe some motivational interviewing and, and some collaborative planning, they're able to come up with ideas to put on there. Um, and so sort of that's the, the first piece of your question of okay, how do we tailor it with a kid? And, and a lot of the tailoring happens with the parent and the caregiver as well. And so um, after we make that safety plan with the youth, we don't just want the parent to come in and say, oh, we made a safety plan with, with Johnny, here it is, um, review it in the car ride right. home. <laughs> um, we want to walk the, the caregiver through it, right? And with the youth's permission, and we often have a conversation with the youth about like, I'm going to bring dad in, I'm going to bring grandpa in, whoever is the caregiver in the situation. 
I'm going to share these parts, what feels okay. Are there any parts that don't feel okay sharing? Um, and so we can have that conversation with the youth, but then once we do bring the caregiver in, um, we want to involve them in several parts. We want to involve them in the warning signs. What are things that they need to be looking out for? And um, the National Institute of Mental Health has like a nice warning signs um, handout that I often give to parents of like, what are things that they need to be looking out for? So there's those general things, but also as a clinician, based on this interview that you did with the youth, what did you learn about um, their own specific warning signs? Maybe for, um, right, right. you know, James, the warning sign is like doing poorly on a math test or um, missing the goal at soccer or fighting with girlfriend. Um, and so we want the parent to know like here are specific things to look out for, right? Because if, you know, James comes home and they did poorly on math, maybe we need to check in with them. Maybe we need to increase our monitoring. Um, so that's one one piece. Another piece that comes to mind are things like communication strategies, like how can yeah. a parent communicate about suicide risk with a kid? Yeah, in a way that's you know engaging and has you know, leads to conversation versus kind of just shutting down, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah, and that's hard. Like I often think that there's like a role of exposure here, and like <laughs> right. a parent has to like practice saying these words, right? And as clinicians, we have to do some education to kind of dispel some of those misconceptions that asking about suicide is going to increase risk or it's going to give somebody an idea, right? Um, so we sort of have to give some of that education, and then maybe support the parent in practicing, like even a role play of like, how are you going to ask? How are you going to ask your kid when you feel worried about them, right? And um, supporting kind of that that language. Um, sometimes I think with kids or teens, we have to think a little bit more creatively. So, for example, I have somebody I've worked with who um, uses a color system, and it's green, yellow, and red. And green, they're doing okay. Yellow, they might be having some suicidal thinking, but it's something that they can kind of manage on their own or with little support. Red is like, I need someone to sit with me right now. And, you know, we need to yeah. um, have additional support. Um, other kids like might send the parent a specific emoji, right? Because mm. expecting a child to like kind of to like say these things for those words to leave their mouth yeah. is hard, right? And so can we sort of kind of meet in the middle um, sometimes? And so supporting parents to kind of come up with communication strategies that are going to feel good with the kid. And we, and we want the child to be involved in that too. Mm -hmm. I appreciate so much of what you've said, especially um, that you maybe inadvertently have tied it into things that that I already do, and I don't work with kids, and I don't I don't work um, in a with the adults as caregivers specifically. But mm -hmm. yet, what started sounded by sounding really overwhelming has begun to sound a little bit more manageable in right. the way that you're describing it, because some of the strategies that you're describing are things that. Um, we do as part of good treatment to begin with. And, and obviously we need to take it a step further, but things like collaborating mm -hmm. and psychoeducation and respecting and acknowledging that the caregiver is the expert on their own kid. You know, we do that with adult clients. You're the uh -huh. expert on your experience, right? So this mm -hmm. is just the next step, being really specific, practicing, doing role plays. All of that is, are, all of those are kind of good clinical skills that, um, now sound more comfortable to me and sound more familiar to me after you've described them in that way. So at least I am feeling a little bit more relieved <laughs> and I can absolutely see how this can help parents feel more effective. Yeah, I appreciate that. Exactly. I think many of these things are things that we do that we have to kind of maybe put in this new new frame or maybe apply to a, a new um, concern. Um, and I wanted to share two, maybe two more areas that I think are so sure. important to involve Please. parents in. And so one is sort of supporting coping skills, right? So I think that's what's different too about working with teens is they might not be able to do all their coping skills on their own. So if you have an adult and part of the coping skills to get out of the house, yeah. um, you're gonna need permission, you're gonna need a ride, right? If, if you're a child. And so, um, you know, bringing in caregivers to know like, what are what are the things, the coping skills that your kid has and how do you support them? How do you encourage them? How do you provide some of that instrumental support? 
Well, and, and part of that too, like I, I really appreciate what you're saying because I could certainly see a circumstance where, you know, for one patient that they, one of their coping skills might be go take a walk, right? And that seems really simple and something they could do on their own. And yet when you've got a parent who's already worried about what is my kid going to do right. when they're on their own, mm -hmm. you know, and what, you know, potential means will they have access to? I can't see them, you know, do I track their phone? Do, they, do I right. limit the space they can go walk in? All of those, it, it something that seems so seemingly straightforward becomes pretty complex pretty quickly. Yes, exactly. And so important, right, to have the support of, of a clinician to kind of figure out, yeah, what is this going to look like if they take a walk, right? Yeah. Do they take the dog? Do they maybe go with a sibling? When is it appropriate for me to go? Um, do we both drive to a park and maybe, I don't know, a walk sort of around the same lake, but maybe in opposite direction so they have a little bit of space, right, and figuring out um, what might feel comfortable for that that family mm -hmm. um, is so important. And I think as well as, you know, a lot of my work has really focused on kind of connectedness and social support as a protective factor. And um, a part of safety plans is um, social support, right? So, you know, the idea behind safety plans is you identify your warning signs and then you try a few things on your own, like distraction, like taking a walk, like, you know, doing some breathing, watching your favorite show. And if those things don't work, then we have to recruit other people um, yeah. to support us, right? And um, I think parents and caregivers can be a critical role. They might be some of those support people. They might help to kind of liaison with some of those support people. And so if a youth maybe includes their aunt, um, maybe it's the caregiver that has to sort of make that connection to say like, you know, um, the adolescent has been struggling. They added you as one of their support people. This might mean that we might reach out to you once in a while. You know, she might just need you to talk to them. They might just yeah. need you to chat with them for a little bit. So doing some of that connection might be a, an important place for, for parents. Um, and opting sort of like the, the cap of our safety plan is mean safety, um, lethal mean safety, which is really critical to suicide prevention just generally as we're all well aware. And I think um, a few important things when working with youth is we wanna really make sure that um, we're really clear and sharing with the caregiver what the youth has thought about specifically. So if youth discusses a, a specific method where whether it is like taking medication, using a firearm um, or something else, we wanna make sure that that specific method is on the parent's radar. Um, and then we want to take steps together with the parent to figure out how do we make the home more suicide safe, right? Um, that always involves um, restricting access to lethal means like firearms. And those can be really hard conversations, right? And I think, you know, within the military culture, firearms are incredibly important, right? right. And um, we need to figure out as providers, like, how do we honor that, right? These values that families have. And how do we take steps to um, make the home more safe, right? And I think one of the things, you know, as a parent who's kind of lived with this a little bit, and I, I will acknowledge I'm not probably like the average parent that has, you know, lived with this because I, I am a mental health provider. I've, mm -hmm. you know, I, I hopefully have some knowledge and skills here. But especially with, you know, lethal means safety, one of the things that I, I knew logically, but it became really personal was like, we're, we're talking about that this is potentially a pretty major disruption of just normal routines at home, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that includes, you know, how are you even storing medications and how has one access those? And what about sharps in the house? How do you store those? And how is access done? And, and I mean, again, things that seem pretty simple and straightforward, but you know, there, there, there can be some, you know, really new routines that have to be developed to to help that child stay safe or that the environment is safe and and then the other piece of it was just kind of like how long do we need to do this right because mm -hmm. the 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 good news is is that it's it's temporary i think mm -hmm. and to, certainly correct me if i'm wrong but the good news is it's temporary this isn't the rest of our lives but it's also not for a week you know and mm -hmm. and then we go back to normal and and so finding that sweet spot of okay we we want to commit to having a safe environment and we need to commit to having the safe environment long enough and recognizing that it's not going to be forever. Those were, for me personally, that was this kind of this recognition and eye-opening experience. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I agree and acknowledge it is sure we can have a list of here, take these 10 steps, but in practice, it is incredibly challenging. It is, it is like a different flow of the way that we've been living life for 10, 15 yeah. years for longer. Right. And I think, 
um, honoring that in our time with our families, right? And figuring out what works for them, right? I think, um, you know, often the, the first recommendation is to remove a firearm for the home, for example. Um, and sometimes that is not feasible. And we have to figure mm -hmm. out what is what is in the middle, right? In the middle is like making sure the firearm is stored separately from the ammunition, making sure that both of them are locked up, right? Um, having conversations with families about what is it, what does it mean for something to be locked up, to be stored? Um, safely, but it, it is, it's overwhelming. And I think that the best sort of approach forward that we have is, is collaborative and, um, and really conversations that are anchored on safety, not about taking anything away. It's about how do we make this safe? And like you're saying, temporarily. And um, I find that question hard because I think temporarily means different. <laughs> it, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. From kid to kid, I have some kids that temporarily is several months because that's that's where they're at and that's what we're managing and, and for some people it's more and for some people it's less and I think that's a, a important place to rely on the clinician to sort of make those those decisions together about sure. when is it okay to take a step back do we maybe do this step-by-step -step approach um to to kind of returning the home to maybe the way it was functioning before as far as some of these um measures taken Gosh, this has been such a, a great discussion. And, you know, I feel like I'm more of a listener than a participant in this discussion. So I appreciate you both. Kevin, I appreciate you sharing your experience and making this such a rich conversation. Dr. Orengo, I appreciate your expertise so much. So much. Thank you. I wonder if we can move to some actionable intel yeah. to help our listeners who either are um, just wanting to know how they can get more training in this area and be more proficient in working with caregivers or even want some resources that you might recommend um, that they can share with caregivers. Do you have some actionable intel that we can share here as well as in our our show notes uh, when we post this episode? Yes, absolutely. Um, so two places that I've been directing people to lately is um, I always appreciate the zero suicide resources and the website is zero suicide.edc.org. And I think they have a lot of like just rich resources about, you know, trainings and sort of different ways that we can kind of um, improve just generally suicide prevention care within an organization. Um, and more recently, the Academy of Pediatrics, along with, I believe it's AFSP, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, um, they have this website called Blueprint for Youth Suicide Prevention. And I've also found some really nice resources, both for um, uh, providers and um, caregivers and um, specific to youth. Um, as well, I know earlier we sort of mentioned uh, the warning signs document from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, and I've also been uh, collaborating with the team here on uh, a few trainings that hopefully will come out uh, sometime later this year, really focused um, on youth suicide risk assessment and management. Um, so I'm looking forward to those as well. Definitely looking forward to that. We'll keep our eyes open. Yeah, we're really uh, so thrilled that you're collaborating with us and educating us in a couple of different ways, not just on this podcast. Um, you're providing so much useful information and resources, and we're going to be thrilled to share that with everybody mm -hmm. when it's available. Thanks. It's been lovely to be here. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Yes. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Like I said, what a great discussion rich and and um yeah. and hopefully just the beginning like there's clearly so many different directions we could have gone here and so much more we could have dug deep into you know perhaps if you're willing we can have you back on again in the future and yeah. and uh, as i understand it well we're also going to have you for one of our monthly webinars yes we are so, yeah so a lot be a more partner to this yes um, a lot more work than you know collaboration here, but also for the benefit of those listeners. So that's right. You can't get rid of us just yet. We're gonna <laughs> perfect <get> around. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, all. Thanks for listening to Practical for Your Practice. Please feel free to subscribe, like, and share. Until next time. <laughs>